Okay, we're going to talk about the reproductive system, and we're going to start off with our first chapter is about the male reproductive system. And there's a few um, particular aspects of the male reproductive system that we have to understand in order to then understand the basis for conception, um, uh, conception and fertilization, development of the embryo and fetus, pregnancy, and really the rest of the topics that we're going to talk about in this, um, this semester. Okay, so first off, just an or a basic orientation to the male and female reproductive system. So uh, both systems in general, so right now we're talking about the male reproductive system, but both systems are organized into um, similar organizations. So both systems, male and female, are organized into, number one, the primary reproductive organs. And in females, those are the ovaries, and in males, those are the testes. Okay? And in females, the ovaries, as we'll talk about in the next section, are um, located within the abdominal um, cavity but, or in the pelvic cavity, but in males, the uh, primary reproductive organs, the testes, are actually located outside of the body. And there's a very um, important reason for that that we'll, we'll get into. So the, the main function of the primary reproductive organs is producing the gametes, producing um, the sperm in males and the, um, uh, and the oocytes or the eggs in females. So the process of gamete production is referred to as gametogenesis, and in males, the process is called spermatogenesis because um, it is the production of sperm, and in females, it's called oogenesis or oogenesis, depending on what you prefer, because it's the production of the oocytes. Okay. Um, the other primary function of the... Um, primary uh, reproductive organs, in addition to gametogenesis, is to secrete sex hormones, okay? um, secrete the, the sex hormones that are relevant for uh, males and females, whether that be estrogen, progesterone in females, um, testosterone in males. The second main component of the reproductive system in males and females is something referred to as the reproductive tract. And the reproductive tract is the system, uh, the structures responsible for transporting and housing the gametes after they are produced. So in males, um, the sperm are produced in the testes, and then they uh, travel to um, a portion uh, of the reproductive tract called the epididymis, which is found right above the testes. And the, in the epididymis, the sperm uh, continue to mature. So they're, pro they're produced, they become uh, functionally competent. And in the epididymis, they sort of undergo some further maturation. And then from the epididymis, we have um, the, the deferens, the vas deferens, the ductus deferens. It's the set of tubes that run from the epididymis um, up through the pelvic cavity um, and into the ultimately the urethra. Okay. So sperm um, upon ejaculation are going to travel through that vas deferens um, into the urethra um, and then out of the out of the penis. Okay. So um, that's the reproductive tract. The third component of the reproductive systems in both males and females are accessory glands that are important for um, reproduction. And these accessory glands, there's many of them in, in women, but in men, um, there are uh, three main ones. And that includes the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, and the bulbourethral gland. Now in males, these three glands produce fluid that together we call semen. Okay? And then the sperm are suspended in that um, mixture of glandular fluid 
that we refer to as semen. So if you notice here, the reproductive tract here, the vas deferens, uh, before it can get to the urethra, it as actually passes through the prostate gland, okay, um, and uh, moves past the uh, seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, and the bulbourethral gland. Now the bulbourethral gland produces relatively small amounts of um, fluid that is added to semen. The seminal vesicles add um, a highly, a not highly, but a, an acidic, slightly acidic uh, composition of fluid to the uh, mixture of semen. And then the prostate gland actually produces the bulk of the fluid uh, contained in semen approximately 60-70% of the fluid, and that um, is a quite alkaline, the fluid produced by the, the prostate gland. So once all these three um, uh, sources of fluid mix together, the total pH actually ends up being quite alkaline in the end. And that's going to be really important because it protects the sperm from the very acidic environment of the female reproductive system, especially the vagina. So if you notice, this vas deferens empties out into the um, empties out into the prostate gland, and then the urethra um, that runs from the bladder um, to the penis it actually runs through the prostate. So the reproductive tract here, the vas deferens portion of the reproductive tract eventually um, enters the urethra. Uh, and is going to exit the penis through the urethra. Okay. Now, the fourth component of the reproductive systems in males and females um, are the external genitalia. Okay. And the external gen gen genitalia in um, males includes the scrotum, the scrotal sac, which is the um, fleshy uh, sac that contains the testes the epididymis, and a portion of the vas deferens. It also includes um, the penis. That includes the shaft of the penis, the glands of the penis, um, and potentially the foreskin, uh, depending on whether a male is circumcised or not circumcised. And then finally, another portion of the reproductive system in males and females includes the secondary sexual characteristics. Now these are um, external characteristics, they're visibly apparent um, from the outside, and they are um, sexually distinct. So males have a very different set of secondary sexual characteristics than females, but these characteris characteristics aren't um, directly involved in reproduction. So it includes things like body hair distribution, um, having facial hair in males and not having facial hair in females, body shape, having a wider pelvis, um, these very basic uh, physical features that, that differentiate males and females, um, but don't actually directly, um, are not directly involved in reproduction. Okay. Um, and the, the, the development of these sexual these secondary sexual characteristics is um, usually begins at puberty because it it's in response to a rise in sex hormones being produced by the primary um, uh, primary reproductive organs. Okay, so um, going back to that one point about how the primary reproductive organs in males are located outside of the body. Uh, compared to females that are located inside the pelvic cavity. Now, if you, you can imagine that having the um, the testes located outside of the body is actually quite a significant vulnerability, right? And when it's housed inside of the pelvic cavity, it's protected in many ways. Having it outside um, makes it vulnerable to damage. But the reason why the testes must be um, located outside of the body is because the process of spermatogenesis, the process of producing sperm, is highly temperature sensitive. 
So in fact, it must occur at a temperature just a few degrees lower than normal body temperature. So over here, what, we are, what we're looking at is a thermo camera um, image of the penis and scrotum. And you notice that um, the, this is, the, the penis is actually quite warm because it's shown in these warmer colors while the scrotal sac is very much at the cooler end of the spectrum. So the scrotum normally sits at a temperature of about 35 degrees Celsius or 95 degrees Fahrenheit, which is significantly lower than our 98.6 um, degrees Fahrenheit body temperature. Okay. Um, and this the position of the scrotum is actually under some degree of control in order to maintain that um, healthy temperature for that promotes spermatogenesis. So when um, when the body gets cold, the scrotum tends to contract and get closer to the body in order to uh, be warmed up. And when the weather is very hot or when the body is hot, the scrotum actually tends to descend a little bit and move away from the body in order to try to cool itself off. So there actually is some reflexive um, control over trying to get that, get those testes in the best position um, to maintain that temperature. So if we look at a closer look at the inside of these testes, um, the testes do those two main things I mentioned. They produce sperm and they produce uh, testosterone. So if we look here at the, at the testes, what we find are that it is packed with these tubules that we call seminiferous tubules. So the bulk of the, um, the testes is, um, is composed of these seminiferous tubules. And it is with, it's about 80% of the mass of the testes. Now, in these seminiferous tubules, you can kind of see it here, we'll take a closer look in the next slide, we've got actually the wall of this seminiferous tubule is very, very thick. It's composed of many, many cells. And then it's got this tiny little lumen that's filled with fluid. And it's a fluid called seminiferous um, fluid. Now, spermatogenesis, the process of producing sperm, actually occur within this thick wall of the seminiferous tubules. So sperm are constantly being produced in these walls and then they um, emerge into the lumen and get mixed with seminiferous fluid and then get sort of um, caught up in the flow of that fluid and move ultimately toward the epididymis where they mature, and then eventually through the um, vas deferens onto the rest of the tract. Okay. So it's the seminiferous tubules. This is the location. Uh, the walls of the tubules are where spermatogenesis occur. And within those walls, we have two cell types. We'll do, look at that in just a moment. But those two cell types are the... Um, uh, developing spermatogonia, so the, the immature um, developing sperm, and then the second cell type within the wall is a cell type called the Sertoli cell, and we'll, we'll, we'll see that better in the next slide. There's a third cell type, so spermatogonia um, or developing sperm, um, Sertoli cells, and then there's a third important cell type in the testes. And it's actually located in this blue portion of the testes, um, which is the connective tissue. And those cells are called Leydig cells. And these Leydig cells are responsible for producing testosterone. Okay. And testosterone has many functions in the male um, reproductive system and in the male body in general. Before birth, testosterone is important in actually masculinizing the male reproductive system, including the reproductive tract and the external genitalia. Okay. It's also, testosterone also before birth 
controls the descent of the testes out of the body and into the scrotum before that baby boy is even born. Okay. And then testosterone, after birth, testosterone production sort of stops, and then it starts up again um, at puberty. And at puberty, testosterone is going to then control um, the, the maturation of the reproductive system and, and the um, external genitalia and the secondary sexual characteristics at puberty. So things like um, the testes enlarge, at puberty, they start producing sperm. Those accessory glands enlarge and start to become secretory. And the penis and the scrotum also enlarge. And spermatogonia, uh, spermatogenesis begins at puberty. Um, additionally, testosterone is very, very important in controlling sexual libido. Um, it also maintains sexual drive throughout um, male adulthood. Uh, it also, um, as I said earlier, controls the development of se secondary sexual characteristics and maintains them. So the male pattern of hair growth, um, the deepening of the voice, the skin gets thicker, the body configuration matures where um, the males have sort of broader shoulders, they have more lean muscle mass, um, and then testosterone also causes some sort of non-reproductive effects. Um, mainly, testosterone is a highly anabolic hormone. It promotes the growth of tissue, especially lean body mass. Um, so men start to develop um, more muscle tissue at puberty. Um, that also Testosterone also increases secretion of oil glands. It also seals off the growth plates on long bones, so it sort of caps off um, height in that way. And testosterone also um, uh, in increases the tendency towards more aggressive behavior. Uh, so many, many actions of testosterone, profound effects on the body. Okay. So what we're looking at here in this slide is actually a little cross-section of one of these seminiferous tubules. Okay, so over here, we, ha we had a sort of cross-section of the tubule, and we're looking at it from far away, and then now we're going to look at it from very close up. <clears throat> and you can see that in blue, we have the developing sperm. And it develops from sort of this very undifferentiated spermatogonium, Okay, this um, spermatogonium, and then that spermatogonium undergoes um, mit mitosis and meiosis, and it develops into the newly forming sperm. And so you can see that at the very, um, the lumen end, so this was the outer edge of the tubule, and this, the top of the slide is the lumen end, that as we get towards the lumen, you're starting to see um, sperm that actually start to look like sperm and um, the next step for these sperm is that they are going to detach from the wall, get swept up into the seminiferous fluid and move towards the epididymis. Okay. So that's the, those are the cells in blue. <clears throat> the cells in between are what we call Sertoli cells. And Sertoli cells are critical for supporting the production of sperm. And it supports spermatogenesis in a variety of ways. Um, the, first of all, those Sertoli cells um, are, are much like epithelial cells in that they have the very tight junctions. And so um, while the spermatogenesis um, is occurring in between the Sertoli cells, the, there's no um, uh, leakage of seminiferous fluid um, in between those Sertoli cells. Okay. And Sertoli cells, during the process of spermatogenesis, they support this process by um, providing nourishment to, this, to the developing um, sperm 
they uh, provide um, all the energy substrate that the sperm are going to need, glucose, um, uh, electrolytes. Okay? The Sertoli cell also has significant phagocytic function. So one of the things you might notice about the difference between one of these immature um, sperm, right, that we, we call spermatids, the difference between one of these spermatids and uh, the more mature version of the sperm is that all of a sudden this cell has lost most of its, if not all of its, cytoplasmic material. Okay? And that's an important part of the process of producing sperm. So the loss of that cytoplasmic material is, is made possible by these Sertoli cells phagocytizing all of that stuff. Okay. The Sertoli cells also secrete and produce seminiferous tubular fluid, which then fills that lumen of the tubes and allows, uh, promotes the movement of these newly formed sperm towards the epididymis. The, another function which is absolutely critical for spermatogenesis is that these Sertoli cells produce something called androgen binding proteins. And androgen binding proteins are proteins that bind to testosterone and prevent testosterone that's being produced by those Leydig cells that are nearby, it prevents testosterone from diffusing away from the site of spermatogenesis. Okay? Because spermatogenesis requires a very high concentration of testosterone. Okay? So the Sertoli cells uh, produce androgen binding proteins and that's critical for successful um, spermatogenesis. So Fun pictures. I, I found this book, um, actually, actually one of my students a couple of years ago found this book at the Strand, and it was uh, filled with just some amazing photos of reproduction and the male-female reproductive system. And so this is actually a photo, um, uh, electron uh, micros uh, micrograph, so electron microscopy uh, photo of the, a cross-section of one of these um, seminiferous tubules. Okay? And so you can see these different uh, levels of immature sperm okay, in, within, embedded in the walls. And then you also see the lumen, this tight lumen, and it's just filled with the flagella of sperm. Okay? And if we take a closer look, what we see are these newly formed sperm that are sort of starting to emerge out of the wall. So really cool photos. So the process of spermatogenesis involves um, uh, many stages. So there's um, three main stages. The first stage is what we call the mitosis of the spermatogonia. Okay. Now the ultimate, um, the ultimate goal in spermatogenesis is to go from what we call a diploid spermatogonium, and a diploid means that it contains 46 chromosomes, which is the same number of chromosomes of every other cell in your body, and it's going to go from these 46 chromosomes ultimately to a sperm that is what we call haploid, meaning that it has half the number of chromosomes, 23. Okay. Now we have to get to a haploid uh, gamete stage because 23 chromosomes, when we finally are going to make this baby, when we're going to fertilize this egg, the baby's going to have half of its chromosomes from its father, and it's going to have half of its chromosomes from its mother. So the sperm are going to contribute 23 chromosomes, and the 
um, oocyte is going to contribute the other 23 chromosomes. So if we don't get to a haploid cell, if we end up with a, with a diploid cell, then we're going to have too many chromosomes, and this um, fertilized egg is going to be totally non-viable. Okay. So the process of mitosis is just cells doubling in number. So, and there's no change in the number of, of chromosomes. So this spermatogonium undergoes lots of mitotic proliferation because we want to have a lot, we don't want to run out of spermatogonium. So it undergoes multiple uh, mitotic divisions. And then the next stage is that it starts the process of what we call meiosis. And the process of meiosis um, is going from a diploid cell to ending up at a haploid cell. Okay? In fact, ending up at many haploid cells. And meiosis happens in two stages. There's what we call the first meiotic division and the second meiotic division. Okay? So this um, spermatogonium that we started off with uh, multiply, okay? and then the, the sum of these spermatogonia become what we call the primary spermatocyte. So this is still a diploid cell. And these primary spermatocytes become, go into the first meiotic division. And the process of the first meiotic division is to um, the process of the first meiotic division is uh, to uh, double the cell. Okay? So you go from one diploid cell to two diploid cells. Okay? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No. You go from one diploid cell, okay, so this is first a, a mitotic division, and the first meiotic division is going from one diploid cell to two haploid cells. Okay? You go from one diploid cell to two haploid cells. That's the first meiotic division. The second meiotic division, those two haploid cells just um, multiply okay, and produce four haploid cells. First meiotic division, you go from diploid to haploid, and then from the, in the second meiotic division, you just produce copies of those two haploid cells, and you end up with four. Okay. So the first meiotic division produces a what we call a secondary spermatocyte, which are haploid, and the second meio uh, meiotic division produces four spermatids, okay, which are also haploid. And then from there, from there, the last stage is a rearrangement of the cell structure to form this pre-sperm cell, which is called a spermatozoa. So this spermatozoa looks a lot like a sperm, but it still needs to travel to the epididymis to become fully functionally mature. Okay. Now, the production of these spermatozoa. You notice at the sp secondary spermatocyte stage and the spermatid stage, you notice that there's this strange link between the cells, right? There's this what we call a cytoplasmic bridge between the cells. The purpose of this cytoplasmic bridge, it's very interesting because this diploid cell with 46 chromosomes is male, which means that it has an X and a Y chromosome, right? The two sex chromosomes. It has an X and it has a Y. But when it undergoes that first meiotic division and it split, the chromosomes split in number, now we produce a secondary spermatocyte. One is going to be X and one is going to be Y. 
Now, the Y chromosome, so this one, let's say this guy is a Y chromosome, and the other one is an X. The Y chromosome is actually a very tiny chromosome, and it doesn't contain all of the genes necessary to keep this cell alive or to continue the process of meiosis. So this Y chromosome spermatocyte needs to maintain a bridge, a cytoplasmic bridge, with the X-containing spermatocyte in order to, to get access to the genes and the proteins that it needs to finish maturing. Okay. So, um, so it, can, it maintains this bridge. So when these cells um, then divide and make copies, you also maintain this bridge. And it isn't until it's finished with the mitotic divisions that these cytoplasmic bridges can be severed. Okay. It isn't until they get to the spermatozoa stage because they now no longer need those chromosomes. So that means that each of these spermatozoa are going to contain either an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. Okay. So that also means that when we get to conception, which is our next unit, that the sex of the fertilized uh, zygote, the sex of the embryo, is going to be determined by the the identity of these sperm. It's going to be determined by whether or not there, the egg was fertilized by an X-containing sperm or a Y-containing sperm. Okay. So once we get our mature sperm, we see that sperm are, are extremely pared down cells. Okay. So this is the body of the cell body of this cell, okay? And if you notice, there's really very little to no cytoplasmic material in this cell. So sperm, the head of a sperm, basically, basically contains a plasma membrane. It contains a nucleus with all of its chromosomes. And it contains this, um, this uh, covering just beneath the plasma membrane of enzymes that we call the acrosome. And this, it's colored in red. This acrosome is packed with digestive enzymes. And it's going to need those digestive enzymes in order to penetrate the outer cellular layers of the egg in order to fertilize it. Okay. So this sperm has a head with a nucleus and a cap of digestive enzymes. It has a motor, right, just below the head. This motor, it's called the midpiece of the um, sperm. It has, it literally has proteins that are arranged in this very particular way to create a motor type mechanism that spins this tail, okay? this flagellum that's composed of multiple microtubules. This motor has the mechanism for spinning this tail, right? It also is packed with mitochondria in order to generate enough energy to um, drive the motor. Okay? So it's got a head with, with the genetic material, it's got a motor, and it's got a tail that allows it to swim and move forward. So the sperm are ex exceptionally um, designed cells. They are designed for two functions. Uh, containment of chromosomes and locomotion. So they are designed with one purpose in mind, to deliver genes, right? To deliver chromosomes to the site of fertilization, and no, there's no other function. Okay. So all of this, 
process of spermatogenesis, which is constantly going on in males. It starts in puberty, and males just continue to produce sperm throughout their lives. And the, you know, the rate of sperm production tends to, to slow down as males get into um, very, very advanced ages. But generally speaking, it starts in puberty, and it is just constant, right? It's not cyclical like the female reproductive system. So this constant production of sperm is controlled by um, hormones, a set of hormones that originate in the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary, excuse me, anterior pituitary. So we have hypothalamic hormones that are released into the short portal system connecting the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. And those hypothalamic hormones um, travel to the pituitary gland and stimulate another set of endocrine glands, endocrine cells, that release a secondary uh, reproductive, a secondary set of reproductive hormones. And those hormones travel to the testes and they control the function of the Sertoli cells and the Leydig cells. So if we look at this um, this next slide, what we see is the, um, the hormone system that controls spermatogenesis. Okay. So it starts, as I said, with the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus releases a hormone called GnRH, or gonadotropin-releasing hormone. And GnRH acts on two sets of cells in the, post, in the anterior pituitary. It acts on what's called FSH secreting cells and LH secreting cells, and it stimulates them to produce FSH and LH. FSH and LH stand for follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Those names are based on the functions that these hormones have in the female reproductive system. Okay. In the male reproductive system, it doesn't do what it's describing, right? It does something different. So FSH controls and stimulates Sertoli cell function. So FSH stimulates Sertoli cells, maintains their survival, and stimulates them to produce those androgen binding proteins to produce those, the glucose and all of the nourishment for the developing sperm. So FSH indirectly is responsible for maintaining spermatogenesis by directly stimulating Sertoli cells. Okay. LH acts on Leydig cells and stimulates the production of testosterone. Now, of course, testosterone uh, directly uh, maintains spermatogenesis because without high concentrations of testosterone, we can't, um, we can't actually have adequate spermatogenesis. So LH controls Leydig production of testosterone, and FSH controls the Sertoli cell activity. Now, in terms of negative feedback, testosterone um, feeds back on this system at the level of the hypothalamus and at the level of the anterior pituitary, just like a classic negative feedback system that involves this um, uh, hypothalamic anterior pituitary uh, system. On the Sertoli cell end, FSH stimulates Sertoli cells, and Sertoli cells produce another hormone called inhibin. And inhibin provides negative feedback at the level of the anterior pituitary, um, controlling the release of FSH. Okay. So the negative feedback is designed to keep this system within functioning within normal limits. But this is the basis for the control of sperm production and functioning of the male reproductive system.